Hello! Welcome to the Now Man Show. My name is Nice Wander. Joining us today is Robert Margoliff. He's the Grammy Award winning electronic music pioneer who's been affectionately called the godfather of electronica. He's an innovative record producer and engineer, audio expert, and film producer. He helped to bring the Moog synthesizer into modern music with Stevie Wonder in the 70s on albums such as Talking Book and his Grammy Award winning album Inner Visions. And in 1980, he produced the classic song Whip It by the band Devo. Along with his collaborator Malcolm Cecil, in 1971 he released the album Zero Time as an electronic duo calling themselves Tano's Expanding Headband, which attracted Stevie Wonder and other leading artists to this emerging electronic music technology. He's worked with Stevie Wonder, Billy Preston, Depeche Mode, Oingo Boingo, Quincy Jones, Jeff Beck, the Isley Brothers, the Doobie Brothers, Joan Baez, Guar, and many more. He's co-produced Chow, Manhattan, a film about 1960s counterculture and collaborated with synthesizer pioneer Robert Moog. He's been a partner of Safe Harbor Pictures and a principal founder of Mikasa Multimedia, specializing in studio mixing of surround sound. He will be featured in the upcoming PBS special Sound Breaking, a series created by the late, great Sir George Martin. His current multimedia project with breakthrough artist Lexi Baker will be the first recording ever to be released in HBS 12.1 headphone surround sound technology. Robert Margoliff, welcome to the Now Man Show. Thank you very much for having me. It's my great pleasure. Uh, I was getting immediate gratification by playing the synthesizer. Yes. There was no school. You couldn't go to school or read a book about this is how you use the Moog synthesizer. Exactly. So I really had to put my mind to learning how to use the synthesizer. And one thing led to another, and I found myself at a place called Media Sound, and I was the synth guru yeah, yeah. at the studio. It was a com During the day, it was commercials. At night, it was closed because the union thing yeah, was yeah, heavy. Yeah, yeah. And that is where I met Malcolm Cecil. And, and so then you've created this electronic duo, which you called it yourselves Tonto's... Tonto's Expanding Headband. <laughs> yes, okay. What does Tonto stand for? The original neo Tambral orchestra. Oh, wow. The interesting thing about that synthesizer was, that, and to this day people don't use the synthesizer that way particularly, yeah, yeah. is normally one person plays one instrument at a time and you mm -hmm. get two or three people in the room, they each have their own instrument, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, with the synthesizer, with the Moog that we had, Tonto, which was actually six synthesizers in a huge, turned into a huge and case. You had the patch board too, right? Yeah, the, we had to patch everything. Yeah, it was all yeah, analog. Yeah, yeah. But the interesting thing was that it was many musicians playing one instrument wow. where the programming was interactive. Right, right, wow. So if like Stevie was playing a bass line, we would make the entire synthesizer transpose with that bass line so that I could then play string parts. And as long as I played everything on the white notes, I couldn't make a mistake. Yes, yeah, yeah. Because it would always be in the key of the bass line. Now, he heard your band, did he? Yes, we did. We put out an album. Herbie Mann heard us one night raving away in the studio at night because media at night was closed basically because yeah. the unions did, did insisted on double time for the players yeah. and the commercial people, you know, during the day I was doing things like Crazy Daisy toilet paper commercials. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, which did not, it was not really all that thrilling, you know. Guy sitting in the back of the room, he says, yeah, hey kid, because I looked like something like a refugee from a U-boat from another planet, right? Now, Had hair like this with a gold vest on yeah. and had a joint sticking out of my mouth. <laughs> and uh, he would say to me, hey kid, could you make that thing sound a little bit more like that tablecloth? You know, and I, I decided at that point that you know, I, I really wanted to concentrate on really investigating electronic music synthesis. The synthesizer is not an instrument that imitates live instruments. Yeah, okay? yeah. A synthesizer takes the sound from the universe. Right, right, right. It's vibrating electrons. It's any sound that you want to make. It doesn't necessarily have to relate to a instrument from the past. That's right. What it was really was the first real major disruptor in yes. music and recording in the 70s. It really changed the face of pop music when we brought the synthesizer to, to bear in the pop music scene. Malcolm, myself, and Stevie were the first two 
sort of really genuinely explored. Wendy Carlos was exploring classical music. Right, right. Other guys were doing, uh, you know, some uh, Tomita was there, Silver Apples uh, was Tangerine there. Tangerine Dream. Tangerine Dream. Jean-Michel Jarre. Yeah. yeah. All of those folks came on the scene, but they were all kind of, you know, trying to do space age right, stuff right. where our m music really sort of aimed itself directly at R&B. And that's where you started with working with, with Stevie Wonder. Correct. What happened was we did an album. Malcolm and I were in the studio late one night. We had this big, it was a former church. Media Sound was a oh, wow, former cool. church. Strangely enough, Bella Bartok lived in that building at one time. You mean time. Uh, Bella Lugosi? No, or Bella, Bella Bartok. Bella Bartok did. Yes. Oh, oh. In the 20s. Cool, yeah. But it was yeah. like a big church, and I had the synthesizer on a big sort of rolling gurney in the studio, so it looked very gothic. Excellent. And uh, Malcolm and I would go in there at night, and I say, Malcolm, I'm not even sure what we're doing is music. <laughs> okay, it was really pretty strange. It didn't matter though. Well, it didn't matter. Uh, Herbie Mann was in the studio one night, heard it. He was a very famous flautist and uh, yes. had a vanity label called Embryo Records that was distributed by Atlantic. And we put the. He said, "You know, here's here, kid. Here's five thousand bucks. Go ahead and make." your record, I'll put it out. I, wow. I said, Herbie, I'm not sure it's music. He said, I think it's music. And Malcolm says, he just needs a little editing. We'll put it together. We'll make it happen. Of course, Malcolm, genius yeah, yeah. player as well. Yeah. So we put the album out, and lo and behold, it got this incredible review in Rolling Stone. Wow. And Steve... That was 71, right? 71. Yeah. And Steve heard it, and the next thing we know, there's a knocking at this door on a Sunday. Yeah. At the studio, Malcolm lived on the third floor in the building next to the front door of the studio, and we looked out, and there was uh, Stevie in a pistachio green jumpsuit <laughs> with his uh, uh, with the guy who who brought him by. Yeah, yeah. And Malcolm's friend, fellow bass player Ronnie Blanco, and uh, it started then, and we didn't leave the studio for five years. Wow. And really, what happened is we really were the disruptors of the technology and bringing electronica to pop music. But uh, and now, as the synthesizer evolved and it was used in pop music more and more and more all the time, how did Devo find you? And you, how did you find Devo? How did that come about? Because you well, produced I was, one of my favorite albums, Freedom of Choice, which includes, of course, their most known hit, Whip It. Right, and strangely enough, I have just cut a cover of the original Whip It, which is, I guess, 35 yeah. years old, yeah. or somewhere near there. Yeah. Right? I have just recut a new version with Lexi Baker. I think now we're starting to, uh, audio is beginning to emerge into a new place. It's been a very sort of uh, interesting uh, disillusion of the old system, the studio system, and yes. the records, and the film companies are also now sort of disincorporating these big we might have big monolithic sort of distributors of audio, but right, right. you know you don't need to go to digital domain to do digital editing anymore. You That's can right. do it on your laptop in your living room. You don't need to go to a recording studio to do, you know, a big recording studio with acoustic flooring and walls and stuff to do uh, to do video, uh, audio or video, because now uh, our laptops have become our new folk instruments. Get your headphones out or your little earphones, and, and, and we're going to participate in this together, okay? So get ready to do that. And this, actually, this it's is, a first. This is a first on broadcast television, so we have another first here on the Now Man Show. So get ready. It's very Just to let now. You know, we're going to do this, and it's very now. It's very now, man. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so the, uh, and I know that you, uh, you put on the website, HPS 12.1 is a disruptive new production technology based on mathematical and cognitive models of audio perception. Now, for the, uh, the gearheads and the, uh, the geeks out there, exactly how would you distinguish HPS 12.1 from the stereo surround sound? Because when people go, most people know, right? from like going to the theaters, like you go you to a Star have, Wars right movie now, and you hear all these different things in the room. Right now, you cannot hear surround sound on earphones. Yes. Okay. Yes. But now, coming along, not only with music, but now with virtual reality. Yes. Okay. Yes. Where everything is now starting to happen on headphones. Uh, we need to be able to have that same spatial, that sense of spatial awareness that we have in the real world, inside, the, whether it's music or gaming, if you're moving inside the space, your head tracking has to That's right. do stuff. But also, you have to be able to listen to the 
background to the music itself. Mm -hmm. You know, I was experimenting. The first record I ever produced, I ever mixed in surround was Superstition with Stevie. Oh, was it really? And, so and there... we had a quad control room. We were fooling around in 1972 oh, right. with a system called QS. Uh, and it was a quad that was supposed to live in vinyl. Yes, then okay. you're right. Okay. Different and so concept. The rooms, the control rooms, when we worked with Steve, we built that control room, Studio B, at the record plant. Well, the difference was, although we couldn't, I tried mixing Superstition in Quad, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and incidentally, I've just remixed a 16-track Master of Superstition oh, did you really? into cool. HPS 12.1. Oh, I can't wait to hear it. It can be heard on my website. Oh, you can, we can yeah, oh, go, go to margaleff.com and you can but hear it. But you will have to, people who are really curious will have to get to, to reach me because that is a password-protected piece of material. Oh, yes, yes. But here I am 42 years later remixing the same song. That's great. The same thing is true with Whip It. I did a, the stereo and now I've done the HPS 12.1 version of it with Excellent. Lexi. Excellent. So is the wheel turning once again? Yes. yes. Is the new yes. disruptor coming when we can start to finally have the full That's right. co concept of surround audio yes. in headphones where you can be on a skateboard and listen to your music and have it in surround, That's where fantastic. you can bring that entire That's wonderful great. emotional energy, the situational awareness of music and effects inside and let it unfold in your head. Front left channel, front right channel, center channel, left side channel, right side channel, left rear channel, right rear channel, upper front left channel, upper front right channel, Upper rear left channel, upper rear right channel, the voice of God. The voice of God is directly over your head. Yes, exactly. So we now have a full space. Wow. Okay. And uh, what we've brought into the studio uh, is, uh, uh, is uh, Lexi's first single, uh, which is mixed in both stereo and HPS. And strangely enough, HPS can live in vinyl. Wow, wow. So. Her album, uh, Ultimate Reality, which will ha have seven songs on it, uh, on one side the vinyl is in stereo, and on the other side the vinyl is in HPS. And, and this is, format's going to be available through all sorts of audio and video, like on iTunes and Amazon and Google. And Everywhere. And Every... Tidal and Spotify and SoundCloud and Bandcamp and Reverb Nation and all this stuff. Yes, all the aggregators. It brings the music, the emotional content back to music in terms of being able to create things that are totally free, existent in space and electronica, but uh, we can create our own world in our own space. And I think that that's what really makes it wonderful. Thank you so much, Robert. And be sure to look for the PBS special coming up with your sound barriers. Also, sound this breakers. is Nice Wonder and Sound Breakers. And you are watching The Now Man Show with Robert Margaleff. Thanks very much. My pleasure. Thank you. And watch your show now, man. That's right. <laughs> All right, back here with uh, Denny Tedesco. As uh, we mentioned earlier, uh, his father, Tommy Tedesco, was an acclaimed studio session musician. Um, and you did a film called The Wrecking Crew, which you produced, co-produced, I should say, and directed, correct? Right. Yeah. Uh, and now it's in, in theaters, it's getting outstanding reviews, it's actually an award-winning documentary. Congratulations. Thank you. Absolutely, I love it. And so we're going to watch an outtake right now to start this conversation with Leon Russell <laughs> talking about working with George Harrison. I was playing on one of George Harrison's records one day. And we were in, a, in take 168. And I went up to him and said, George, do you want me to play the same thing 168 times, or do you want me to play 168 different things? Because this drives me crazy. I didn't, I didn't like to do that. But some people, I mean, he was overdubbing on, on my wedding album. I had one of his songs on there. He just played a guitar solo, and it was great. I said, well, that's good. And he said, oh, no, that's not quite good. Let me play it again. So he played, I had 40-track machine, and he played 25 more solos. I kept all of them. We got to the end of solo 25, and I said, well, George, listen to this one, see what you think. I played it, and he said, well, that's great. What is that? And I said, that's number one. All right, Leon. Yeah, phenomenal <laughs> guy. Yeah. 
So you, you interviewed him towards the end of the production? Yeah, right? I just feel it's historically, I want these things down, even if it's you know for YouTube or whatever. If I have a chance to talk to someone, let's put it on. And while these people are still here, uh, get them on film. You yeah, know, and, and I was you can lucky. always do additional films. Exactly. Part and, you two, know, part three, or yeah, however many you need to we'll do. We'll see about that. <laughs> uh, but I was really happy because I wanted the voices. I wanted their voices. Let's finish this segment sure. with uh, a clip okay. that uh, actually has your father in it. And uh, Leon Russell is, is uh, telling, uh, well, actually, everybody else is telling, telling the, the story, story, and he's verifying it. Uh, so that, I know the story. <laughs> you know what, and it's funny because I never heard this story until Cher and Leon told it. Wow. And I wish my father was around to, I would, just to ask those questions, like, what happened? Yeah, exactly. And I never heard it until then. And here, there, here's the clip with Leon Russell uh, talking about a session. Can you name the piano player in all of these songs? When I was playing as a side man, I kept my mouth shut. I didn't say anything to anybody about anything. Unless I happened to know the arranger or the producer, then I'd say something if I had an idea. But normally I didn't know anybody and I just kept my mouth shut. He had that magic touch on the piano. I don't know what you call down home, a southern style piano playing that he did. It was magnificent. And I was so taken with Al Delory and his capability. And he put Al, later on, he put Al playing electric piano, yeah. which was just a fill kind of, I mean, just something to fill up the sound with Leon Russell playing the acoustic piano. And I said, gee, you know, I thought Al was great. And he says, no, Leon Russell, man, he's got hands. He can reach octaves yeah, with right. his, you can't, you can't beat that. I figured out early on that if I wanted to be heard on the record, I had to play high. So I always played high. And all those high parts on those Phil's records, it's me. I did that so I could be heard. If you don't do that, you get lost you know, in the wall, so to speak. Leo never said boo to anybody, you know. he just come in, play his piano, you know. And so one day, he came to work completely, completely drunk. I mean, so drunk, so drunk. And he went in, and he sat down at the piano, and he and, and who was playing next to him? Don Randy, I think. And everybody, I mean, he was actually talking. He never spoke. And everybody was like coming in, did you see, did you see Leon, did you see Leon? And so everyone was like just looking at him, you know, and he was being really funny too, because I never heard him say a word. So Philip was like totally knocked out, but then finally he wanted the session to begin, you know, and, and Leon was just doing, you know, all this kind of crazy stuff. And so Philip said, you know, Leon, have you ever heard of the word respect? And Leon jumped up on the table, on the piano, and he said, Philip, have you ever heard of the word you? And everybody, I mean, that was, the, I mean, we, they couldn't get it together for half an hour. People were like dying on the floor. I mean, tears rolling in the studio because it was just, it was one of those, you know, the weirdest thing you ever saw. The story, the way Cher told it, the Phil Spector story, that's absolutely accurate. First of all, Tommy was there that day that I did that horrible drunk bonanza on top of the piano at Phil Spector. The next day, Tommy came over to my apartment and said, Leon, said, I want you to go on the road and preach. I'll pay for the whole thing. I'll buy the buses, I'll buy the trucks, I'll pay for every dime of expenses, and you just give me a percentage back to pay me back. We were on this day with Glenn Campbell, and they brought <laughs> Leon in, and I'll never forget. And Leon panicked, he was sitting there, and, and Glenn says, Leon, just play that that you did in Oklahoma. He says, he says they don't know nothing here. So Leon, <laughs> Leon played Leon Russell, yeah, right. and all of a sudden, they don't know nothing. That was his style. That's what they loved. That's what he did from there on it. I would play those sessions. We'd play tracks. We have chord sheets, so we'd play the tracks. Sometimes we'd play them ten times before we ever heard the melody, heard the singer. Just out of boredom, I'd write songs to those tracks as they was going by.
And it's, you know, those are the surprises I didn't know about over the you know 19 years of making the film. Things like that I loved. And you, I'm sure you learned a lot about your father and and just everything just all at once. The just amazing multiplicity of stories. So we're going to talk now about your most recent film, uh, which is um, called The Music of Strangers. Mm -hmm. Let's watch a clip right now. The clearest reason for music, for culture, is it gives us meaning. We started as an idea, a group of musicians getting together and seeing what might happen when strangers meet. We scoured from Venice to Istanbul, Central Asia, China, and Mongolia, looking for incredible talent. American orchestra, that's very interesting. This was like the Manhattan Project of music. No one knew what was going to happen. I knew there was going to be naysayers. You're taking this traditional music, mixing it together and diluting these traditions. Arts is about opening up to possibility. Possibility links to hope. We all need hope. I'm always trying to figure out how I fit in the world, which I think is something that I share with seven billion other people. Since I left Syria, I found myself experiencing emotions far more complex, like can a piece of music stop a bullet? In 1966, Cultural Revolution, my parents asked me to learn music to escape. In Iran, the revolution, chaos, I had to leave by trying to kill the human spirit. The answer of the human spirit is to revenge with beauty. I think the challenge is keeping your roots alive. That's a new way of thinking about music, about what people can do together. There is no East or West. It's just a globe. We don't speak perfect English or perfect Chinese or perfect Persian, but we speak perfect music language. Being part of this experiment makes me understand what it means to be alive. Everybody is afraid, but you make a connection to another human being. You can turn fear into joy. So the Yo-Yo Ma called this, this group he assembled the, the Silk Road Ensemble. Mm -hmm. um, what was your experience when you first met Yo-Yo Ma? What was that like? Now, well, he is obviously a very world-renowned mm -hmm. cellist. Mm -hmm. And again, it's part of the world of music I didn't know that much about. I mean, mm -hmm. I knew my basics of classical music and yo-yo, but mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I didn't really know who he was and what, where he was coming from. Yeah. Um, and I had one of those classic document, documentarian experiences where you meet somebody and you say, oh, I could follow this guy with a camera anywhere. Yeah, yeah. Because um, he was so unexpectedly um, funny and smart and profane. <laughs> right, wow. Yeah, all things I did not expect. Wow. I mean, he was really just... Um, kind of a revelation for me. Um, but more than anything, the ideas that he's been grappling with as an artist for mm -hmm. 50 years now mm -hmm. are the same things I grapple with, which is how, how does our art and our culture um, make the world a better place? How do yes. we use it to do something other than just um, uh, enjoy ourselves, you know, what's the value of aesthetics in that way? And I think he has been really struggling with that. Yes. And I think really coming up with interesting answers for yeah. that. And I think the thing that I came to understand and part of what he's trying to do with these musical exchanges and this idea of bringing together musicians of vastly different backgrounds is very much this idea that we understand more about other people through our culture than through anything else. I mean, and by culture I mean food and film and yes, music. I mean, everything. we know more, I know more about Thailand through Thai food than I do through That's anything right. else. You know, That's that right. It's a way of understanding. And I think that's his big thing is it's this idea of empathy. How do we build empathy? Yeah, yeah. And, and I think I was, I've been thinking about the same issues. I mean, I, I, 
I love this Roger Ebert quote where he called movies empathy machines. Yeah, and yeah. I think music and, and film can fulfill both that, that same purpose, which is we get to understand something of the other. We get to walk in somebody else's shoes. And they're, not, they're no longer demonizable. They're not the other anymore. There's somebody who we can relate to. You see the, the, the human and the spiritual connection. Absolutely. You and know. you realize the commonalities in terms yes. of what people really want and how we think about things and our common, you know, everything from our DNA to our moral structure. You know, I think music and culture just help bring all that out in a way that religion and politics and economics often do the opposite of. That's right. You know, and I, you know, I grew up as a preacher's son, so I, I you know, to me it's like music is one of those things that it's in the human experience, but it takes you to another place that's not really human. No. You can't, it's, it's like consciousness or something. Yeah. So it becomes something that is, that is otherworldly almost, you well, know, and it transforms you. And, and I like the way Yo-Yo Ma says, uh, it, you know, he, he's, his focus is turning fear into joy. I thought, you know, and even he learned from meeting all these people from all around the world how important it is, even more than he probably originally even thought, right? Mm -hmm. how, Absolutely, and I think it's it's become this kind of his life's calling, mm -hmm. uh, in a way of trying to figure out how he can use the arts to make people understand each other. And and I know that sounds very kind of Pollyanna-ish, yeah. you know. Yeah. But at the same time, he's a believer in it, and I've seen evidence of it in what he's done, and not just him, but the musicians who he's gathered. And it's something in America we tend to think of the arts as nice but non-essential. You know, it's right. like the frosting on the cake. You know, to me really it's the opposite. It's the culture's the plate that the cake sits on. You know, oh, that I couldn't agree with you more, Morgan, and I thank you for saying that on this show. He tells the story uh, of the music of Queen, as and primarily uh, Freddie Mercury. The bottom line is we're talking about political economics. Absolutely right. right. And and we've got big businesses out there whose existence is based on fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. And if it, if it is, in fact, the fossil fuels that are creating this global warming or this climate change, call it what you like, they, that spells doom for them. And they That's don't right. want that to be the case. So That's you've right. got this actually a, a, a cult of deniers. Um, some of them are paid big bucks to come up with negative mm -hmm. information mm -hmm. to poo-poo the idea of fake global news. warming or climate. Oh, yeah, fake news. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's what yeah. it is. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah.